Hi, I'm Lisa Smith, Research Associate at the William Davidson Institute's Healthcare Research Initiative. I'm here today with Amy Lehman, the founder of the Lake Tanganyika Floating Health Clinic. And we are thrilled to have her here today to hear more about her experience in global health care. Welcome, Amy. Thank you. First, could you tell us a little bit more about your organization, the Lake Tanganyika Floating Health Clinic? Sure. Um, so the Lake Tanganyika Floating Health Clinic uh, uh, started about three and a half years ago. Um, and our overarching goal is to build a regional hospital on a ship that goes up and down Lake Tanganyika, which is the longest lake in the world, to access all the populations who live around the lake and are otherwise inaccessible. Um, what we do now um, is these discrete outreach projects in the four countries around Lake Tanganyika where we begin to address some of the most pressing you know, public health, um, you know, medical related problems. Yeah, and you mentioned access being one of the issues, but what are the specific kind of needs within this population, like health needs or otherwise? So the, uh, the lakeside population around Lake Tanganyika is about three and a half million people, but almost 12 million people live in the Lake Tanganyika Basin, and it's one of the most inaccessible places really on Earth. Um, it's in the middle of sub-Saharan Central Africa in the Albertine Rift and it's surrounded by these relatively tall mountains and the road infrastructure around the lake is poor to non-existent depending on the country that you're in. Uh, there are four countries around Lake Tanganyika, um, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Tanzania, Burundi, and Zambia, but it's really Eastern Congo and Western Tanzania that make up the majority of the coastline. So you have these millions of people who live in this very inaccessible location um, who suffer from um, things like malaria. Malaria is still the number one cause of death in the basin, unlike many other sub-Saharan countries. Mm -hmm. uh, maternal child health is a major problem. We basically have, depending on the region that you're talking about along Lake Tanganyika, you know, between a 20 to 25 percent under five death rate. Um, we still have cholera, we have measles outbreaks, we have populations that haven't been vaccinated. So uh, sort of standard infectious diseases that have been eradicated in many other places um, are still present there. Um, we have problems with things like burns, for example, because for the most part there isn't any electricity around Lake Tanganyika, so people are using open flame and kerosene for light and to cook food. Um, so kids get burned um, really with a lot of frequency, typhoid, typhoid perforations, lots of parasites. Yeah. <laughs> So based on all of those needs, how do you decide which services the clinic will offer or what process goes into that and do you have plans for a whole portfolio of services? Well, we have plans for a whole portfolio of services mm -hmm. um, and we work very closely with the local ministries of health and the little dispensaries and health centers that dot Lake Tanganyika that have trouble with supply chain uh, to get you know medicines and equipment into the region as well as educational enhancement for uh, people who staff these little outposts. Mm -hmm. um, we initially got started um, doing service provision in the malaria space because malaria is the number one cause of death um, and it's sort of a low-hanging fruit where if you do the right kinds of combination of, of education and prevention through use of bed nets, etc., you can have quite a lot of impact without the need to have a lot of technology. Um, However, we just did another outreach where we were doing fistula repair for women who had suffered from obstetric fistula, which is much more of a specialty surgical uh, service. And we just made the plans to, you know, build the capacity to do that along the lakeshore. So we were trying to address the problems that really are most pressing but at the same time with the with with the hospital ship we should be able to address any number of problems both basic and and of a specialty nature okay 
And you mentioned some community involvement. What kind of innovative methods have you used to engage the community in the work that you're doing for buy-in or for ownership and sustainability? I mean, I don't actually think that community involvement is innovative at all. I think it's practical and normal and mm -hmm. what all people who work, you know, in, you know, rural settings need to do yeah. and so what we do is we go there yeah <laughs> <laughs> and we talk to people mm -hmm. <laughs> and we we talk to people who work there we talk to healthcare workers we we talk to people who provide other kinds of social services we talk to community members we talk to patients um and we try to understand okay what what's happening here? What are the problems? Mm -hmm. What are the problems that you face as a mother who lives in this village along Lake Tanganyika? What do you need that mm -hmm. you can't get? Mm -hmm. You know, um, we talk to nurses who staff these far-flung health centers along Lake Tanganyika and we say, you know, how do you do your job? Or how are you unable to do your job? Mm -hmm. um, things like that. And just in the course of our, you know, presence in the basin and our desire to be collaborative, I think we've, you know, developed very, very good, you know, relationships with mm -hmm. these communities. But, you know, I don't think it, you know, it's, it's just common sense. <laughs> <laughs> So now I know you have your medical degree and a business degree, but um, can you tell us more about your path, both educational and otherwise, to where you're at now and the work that you're doing? Like what brought you to develop this type of floating clinic? Um, <laughs> well, when I went to medical school and business school, I didn't think that I was going to be building a hospital ship on Lake Tanganyika, mm -hmm. I can tell you that. Um, I actually spent you know, 10 years of my young adulthood working towards becoming a general thoracic surgeon, right, which is like a highly subspecialized surgeon that I thought I would have a job in, you know, a tertiary care medical center in the United States. Um, I happened to have some medical problems myself, and I had surgery, and I was injured by the surgery that I had, and suddenly, for like health and physical reasons, this sort of path that I thought I was going to be taking, uh, you know, appeared to possibly not be feasible for me anymore. Mm -hmm. And so through various experiences that I had had in the Lake Tanganyika Basin in the past, uh, the kind of professional 180 that I did in my life, you know, was this. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. <laughs> And how long, have you been, yeah. <laughs> how long have you been doing this work with the clinic, like formulating the idea? So this has the... been um, my full-time job for about three and a half years. But I first had this idea um, the first time I visited Lake Tanganyika. That was as a tourist, an intrepid tourist, a crazy tourist, but as a tourist nonetheless. Um, I had an experience there that um, kind of got my mind thinking and uh, that was in 2006 I guess mm -hmm. okay now much of your work like our work at the WGI healthcare research initiative deals with access access to medicine services and health information what do you feel are the bigger challenges that remain when we think about access and how can we begin to address those well, I think a couple of things. I think that infrastructural access is probably the easiest thing to design mm -hmm. and to overcome and probably is the most financially onerous. Um, but I think that the next level of access, which has to do with relationship building, with, you know, real capacity building of, of of healthcare workers, mm -hmm. um, you know, patient trust, you know, patient empowerment. Those are things that are extremely time consuming um, and require a lot more give and take and a certain amount of finesse. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so I think there, 
like if you have an endless pot of money, right, you can design any number of, of ways to overcome, you know, physical access boundaries. Mm -hmm. But will those things that you design, you know, be culturally appropriate? Will people trust them? Mm -hmm. Will they use them? Mm -hmm. You know, that's a whole, that's a whole other question. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's one that we think about all the time. And part of the reason why, you know, before there even is a ship, mm -hmm. you know, we have these relationships in the basin so that we, we feel that we're addressing the physical access issues with a method that's comprehensible and will work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, another one of the topics many of our healthcare seminar speakers discuss is how technology impacts their work and the field of healthcare. I know this is something you've written about a little bit before, so could you provide us with some examples from your work and how mobile health technology or internet access has impacted the work that you've done with the clinic and maybe some of your plans for the future? Um, so uh, I, I'm pro interesting technological ideas mm -hmm. and definitely feel that they have a role. Um, where we start from, though, in the Lake Tanganyika Basin is probably about as basic as you can get in mm -hmm. that um, a very large area of Lake Tanganyika doesn't even have cell phone coverage. So when we start talking about things like telemedicine and M health and that kind of thing, you know, really no one has a phone, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, people can't talk to each other. So we have been thinking about how can we adapt certain kinds of already existing technology to establish the most baseline communication capacities between these little health centers and dispensaries and the regional hospitals that exist, um, you know, inland and with us so that we can sort of begin to open this dialogue of, oh, if we can talk to each other a little bit and we can text each other a little bit, you know, what does, you know, what does that lead to for us in terms of, you know, levels of service, you know, or how can we capture certain data that are very hard to capture otherwise without this kind of minimal communication access. You know, in the future, when we have the boat, you know, we will have a, a, an internet connection to the outside world um, and to all of the countries around Lake Tanganyika, you know, and our goal would be to establish that kind of connectivity for these land-based centers as well. But we know that it's going to take a certain amount of time mm -hmm. in order to, to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so looking ahead as you begin this new year, outside of potentially working on access to this kind of technology and growth with that type of thing, what do you foresee as the next developments for the floating clinic and what are kind of the big next steps short term and long term? Um, well, in February, we're actually going to be on the Congo side in the south um, putting in this sort of proto communications network, if you will. We will be linking up some of the far flung little health centers with MOBA Regional Hospital. Um, and so we're adapting some technology that's used by mining and oil and gas companies to send, you know, certain amounts of you know, information both with voice and texting, mm -hmm. uh, using radio and and some satellite signal. So we'll be installing that, um, you know, shortly. Mm -hmm. um, and are I think we're very interested to see, you know, how that ends up being used and and what information we get as a result of sort of doing this initial this initial net, you know, small network. Yeah. Um, we have some other outreach projects planned, including something that is, you know, a little unusual for us. Um, it's more of sort of an art installation and an awareness um, of the lake uh, that we plan on doing in partnership with the, the artist called JR, who is um, a photographer and has done these huge public installations um, in many large cities around the world, as well as in the favelas in Rio and in 
the Kibera slums outside of Nairobi. So we're planning to do a kind of installation, if you will, on Lake Tanganyika to bring more attention and awareness to the basin. And probably most excitingly, our naval architecture and engineering plans will be complete in a few weeks. And so we'll have these concept designs of, you know, what this hospital ship will look like, the economic analysis of, you know, the capital expenditures and the operational costs. And so, you know, we'll be pounding the pavement with those plans. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's all really exciting stuff. Um, and finally, to wrap things up, one question many students preparing for their professional careers may wonder is what one or two pieces of advice would you sh be sure to share with anyone looking to take an innovative idea and put it to practice? Are there a couple things that you would want to pass on to other students to help them make an idea a reality? Um, yeah, go there. <laughs> <laughs> um, people should... You know, people can have lots of tremendously exciting and innovative and interesting ideas, but your idea has to work mm -hmm. in the context and the community in which you intend it to be used. And if you don't understand how things work in that context, you're going to have a much harder time with your concept and design. <laughs> um, so... So yeah, so so go where <laughs> you think you want to be and learn from the experience. Um, you know, there's a lot of information that's already out there. I think sometimes where humanitarian and development projects falter is with this very top-down external approach to solutions when you know, often, you know, there could be plenty of fantastic ideas for solutions that are at the local level, mm -hmm. and what people need is, is an advocate to help mm -hmm. them develop those, those very solutions, which will work for that community. Yeah, that's great advice. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us and for coming here. We look forward to hearing more from your speech this evening, and um, we appreciate you visiting the Institute. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Mm -hmm.